Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, and this event is being sponsored by the um, General um, Board of Archives and History. I know you've heard from them a couple of times, but they've got a lot of things going on right now. And um, so this will be a history of lifting of the band that happened yesterday and what it's looked like over the history of the church. So this is a historical exploration of that. Thank I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Thank you all for coming. Um, like, like we just heard, right, the General Commission on Archives and History is excited to mark yesterday as a historic moment in the life of the United Methodist Church. But for right now, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues up on stage to share their stories. Good morning, friends. My name is Reverend Effie McAvoy, and I am an ordained elder in full connection serving the people of Shepherd of the Valley United Methodist Church in Hope, Rhode Island. Yes, I am the pastor of Hope. I am a seated delegate from New England Annual Conference of the postponed 2020 General Conference. In addition, I am a member of the United Methodist Queer Delegate Caucus and by virtue of my ordination, the Queer Clergy Caucus. The General Conference of the United Methodist Church, or the UMC, has eliminated anti-LGBTQ plus legislation from its Book of Discipline, effectively ending 52 years of institutionally sanctioned discrimination. The global body of 862 voting delegates, about 740 of us seated, has spent almost two weeks in unusual civility, <laughs> removing <laughs> prohibitions against same-sex marriage, ordination of LGBTQ plus people, and, and, and bans against funding education about LGBTQ plus affirmation, and the belief that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teachings. Let that sink in with civility. 28 years ago, come June, June 6th to be exact, I was ordained here in the Western North Carolina Annual Conference at Lake Junaluska Assembly. For me, the ending of the restrictions for LGBTQAI plus persons happening here in my conference of origin is so very personal and so very healing. I am truly thankful to God for the opportunity to be a part of this historic moment in our beloved church. Thank you. Hello, I'm Reverend Austin Atkinson, one of the co-conveners of the Queer Clergy Caucus. And like Reverend McAvoy and Reverend Bonner, I'm now part of the Queer Delegate Caucus. I serve at Light of the Hill, United Methodist Church, a reconciling congregation in Puyallup, Washington. Uh, you might need help spelling that. You can find me on social media and find my profile in order to do so. The advocacy of the new Queer Delegate Caucus has been instrumental to these historic advances in the world's third largest mainline denomination. The Queer Delegate Caucus contains 73 delegates, 31 of whom are general conference voting delegates, and we keep finding new queer delegates every day at conference. <laughs> at this general conference, the efforts of the Queer Delegate Caucus have been augmented by longer time caucus groups, including Affirmation, Reconciling Ministries Network, and the United Methodist Queer Clergy Caucus. These organizations refer to their collaboration in this general conference as the United Methodist Queer Collective. I am proud to be up here with you today. I praise God for these momentous steps forward for the queer people in the United Methodist Church. Queer clergy are now protected from being stripped of our ministries and our livelihoods because of who we are. Queer candidates for ordained ministries now have greater opportunity to fulfill their calling in the United Methodist Church, but they are still vulnerable to differing levels of welcome based on the leadership of the conference where they live. Mm -hmm. With these new securities, queer clergy will continue to help make the path for ordination more accessible to our queer siblings who are called to join us in ordained ministry and extend God's love to all. 
Oh, no, Jan. Good morning. I'm Jan Lawrence, I'm the Executive Director of Reconciling Ministries Network. My pronouns are she, her, hers. RMN is a caucus group that's been working in the Methodist world for intersectional justice for 40 years. This week's legislative actions are freeing and have been historic. Hmm. They're freeing for me personally and for LGBTQIA plus people across the United Methodist Connection. RMN has been organizing congregations that are safe spaces for queer people to attend for 40 years. RMN has been advocating for change in legislative policy for 52 years. Mm. Even before we existed, many who are connected to us today were, were advocating for change to this policy. I too am honored to be up here with this group of people. It is a moment that none of us ever imagined, I think I can safely Amen. say. Amen. Um, in this season, RMN will continue relationship building in the global church. We are recommitting the local congregations as we transition into a church that has made legislative progress towards inclusion, but still has yet to live into what that means. Mm. We're continuing to develop curriculum and other resources that will help churches until we get to the point that every church in our beloved denomination is a place of affirmation. Hmm. I also have to mention that there are those who are no longer with us. Amen. We stand on their shoulders in this work as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Without them, this day would have looked so very different. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hello, I am the Reverend Hannah Adair Bonner. I am part of the Eastern Pennsylvania delegation and a queer delegate. I've been appointed to become one of the two co-pastors leading Hollywood United Methodist Church in Los Angeles, California on July 1st, a congregation once served by Reverend Ed Hansen, who was an early affirmation leader who was not able to serve publicly, as I will now be able to do. Mm. Today I want to speak out for affirmation leaders whose work for LGBTQ people spans the last 50 years. I stand on their shoulders and remember their sacrifices. In particular, I stand on the shoulders of Eastern Pennsylvania's own Reverend Beth Stroud. Her bright and bold spirit paved the way for my ministry as she lived her truth. Today the harmful language is gone. Now the work of love, healing, and justice calls us forward. LGBTQ people have always been a part of the community and history of the United Methodist Church. We have never passively accepted discrimination. Instead, we have always found joyful and creative ways to proclaim our confidence that God loves us with an everlasting love. Amen. Mm -hmm. Today, the United Methodist Church faces a more hopeful future, one in which our LGBTQ community steps forward unapologetically to be seen and celebrated and put to service yes. in all the wholeness of who we are as beloved children of God. Amen. This wouldn't be a history uh, press conference without a little bit of a history lesson. So our founder, John Wesley, and those early Methodists. Can you say who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. I am Dr. Ashley Bogan. I'm the General Secretary of the General Commission on Archives and History. Our founder, John Wesley, and those early Methodists didn't get their name Methodist from a methodical, routinized, personal way of living. We are a people called Methodist because of the ways we lived out and embodied the love of God through witness to this world. The earliest written, published use of the term Methodist to describe John Wesley and those at Oxford was printed in an Oxford newspaper called the Fog Daily in 1732. The paper stated that a group referenced as Methodists were causing no small stir in Oxford. But what exactly was this no small stir? Well, John Wesley and William Morgan had been visiting persons in prison, and in 1732, one of the inmates they ministered to was a man named Thomas Blair. Thomas Blair was on death row for the alleged offense 
of having a sexual relationship with another man. John Wesley and his friend John Clayton believe that Mr. Blair was being victimized, further victimized by his fellow inmates, and sought to ensure his basic humanity. Clayton and Wesley took a particular interest in his trial, and they marshaled his evidence and sought to ensure that the trial would convince any person of Blair's innocence. The day of Blair's trial, John Wesley rose at 4 a.m. and rose 12, rode 12 miles on horseback to be present. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Blair was found guilty, but his life was spared, and he was fined about 20 marks, which is about 5,000 pounds in today's standards. Unable to raise the funds from uh, behind bars, John Wesley again came to Blair's aid and raised it for him. The no small stir of Wesley's ministry with and concern for Blair and for all persons, but especially those most outcast by society, was literally how we got our name Methodist. And y'all, it is absurd that we do not tell this story widely. What it means to be Methodist, to be followers of Wesley, to be followers of Jesus, is to risk all to ensure that everyone knows that they are worthy of God's love, of their own self-love, and of love of others in the body of Christ. With the vote yesterday and the votes that will continue to come forward over the next few days, United Methodists are finally remembering who we are. And to wrap up, I would like to make another announcement. Earlier this week, as has been mentioned, the ban on funding um, for LGBTQ education and preservation was lifted. And so as of this morning, the Journal Commission on Archives and History and our executive committee would like to announce that we are opening a Center for LGBTQ United Methodist Heritage to be housed at the Journal Commission on Archives and History. This center will allow us to intentionally seek out, preserve, and tell the stories of those whose voices, ministries, and witness have for far too, far too long been cast aside and silenced. At this historic press conference is just an example of the stories that we will collect and share. Thank you all for your witness and your ministry and your love of the United Methodist Church. Thank you. So y'all stay tuned. The United Methodist Church is just getting started. Amen. 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 If you all have any questions, we can answer some. We can go to the mic, she asked. You didn't hear her, but she did. I did. She said he needs you to go to a mic right now. Hi, I'm, I'm Liam Adams. I'm the religion reporter at the Tennessean. Um, if especially some of the uh, queer caucus folks can speak to, um, and RMN folks speak to the level of specificity that went into the anti-LGBTQ restrictions and thus the precision of the effort to target and petition to remove those restrictions and the fact that it took decades for the implementation of those restrictions but just days for them to be removed. Oh, it didn't take days, honey. <laughs> Can I, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. you're right. So, <laughs> I asked Jan specifically because she has been in this battle the longest. COVID did nothing good for this country except for delay general conference for a bunch of years, which in turn gave us opportunity to organize more completely and wholly than we have been able to in past general conferences. The general conference, the call general conference of 2019 did something to our church that caused great heartache and great just distress. But that distress opened the eyes of people who normally would have remained silent out of fear of, of being ridiculed themselves. You know the thing about being guilty by association. Well, because of what happened in 2019 and the meeting in middle ground that did not take place, folks' eyes were open to use a scriptural passage, the scales fell from their eyes. 
and in turn, they were able to see that the discriminatory practices that were being held toward LGBTQAI plus persons was indeed a damaging affect, not just against gay clergy or queer parishioners or those persons who are living in silence, but a, a problem for the entirety of our denomination. That happened in 2019. And then the pandemic shut everything down and everybody had to be closed inside to reevaluate, to look at self. And at the same time, we in the United Methodist Church who were called gathered and said, we have to do it differently this time. And then General Conference was postponed, but we didn't postpone. General Conference was postponed again, and we continued to meet and plan and grow. For the Queer Delegate Caucus, it started out with two people, Helen Ride and Caleb Parker. And then Helen Ride and Caleb Parker called me, Effie McAvoy, and my brother Derek out of, what's Derek's last? Scott, the third, uh, from Florida. And then we began to talk and to dream. And from we four came 15. And from those 15 came 30. And from those 30 came 52. And from those 52 came 70 plus and more still today as we gather here at General Conference. So reconciling ministries began this work before or right around the time of my birth and <laughs> continues. I know I just had to do that to you, sweetie. <laughs> and today, today. So no, honey, it did not happen overnight. We've been dealing with this and working so delicately and deeply for decades. Today is just the day that it culminated in the hard work and that light that, uh, that the scriptures reminds us uh, that shines in, in the city on the hill that cannot be hid. Well, it was brought forth. And as we climbed that mountain, we reached a summit. Now we still have more to climb because we are not just climbing one mountain, we're climbing a range of mountains. Amen. There's much work for us to do, but not just overnight, not just a few years, yeah. decades. Effie, what was the phrase you used earlier? Was it unusual level of civility? Or what was the, what was the anyway. Um, unusual, yes. Yeah, uh, it, it's been unusual. Um, the tone and the conversation and the civility and the collaboration that we've seen this year at General Conference is unlike any in recent memory. Um, queer folks have braced ourselves to come to this to just fight for our basic dignity to even be named on this stage while we are being discussed as an issue, it has been rough and harsh. When John Wesley submitted to be more vile, he was not talking about the ways that the church and our siblings in Christ have maligned and treated us in the past. Removing codified discrimination doesn't automatically change actions and behaviors, nor does it make amends for past harms. That being said, the revisions of the Book of Discipline are huge steps forward, and we are excited about the increased possibilities for God's love to be reflected by the United Methodist Church in the future and in the ministry of queer folks in the church. I have two questions. Um, Austin, could you run by those numbers of how many are in the caucus, first of all? Um, yeah, let me pull that up again in just a second. I just added another this morning. Another number. <laughs> so I told maybe, you every day. Maybe Hannah can tell you since she has a new um, number. So 73 plus 1 is 74 delegates, 31 of whom um, are voting delegates and as opposed to reserves that um, can rotate in and, and cover their backs. Um, the reserves, I, I'm one of the reserve delegates, and a lot of what we do is monitoring what's happening there um, and feeding information um, as folks are getting prepared. Um, technology has also changed General Conference, and we can work in real time and collaborate even if we don't have um, voting or speaking privileges on the floor. If I can say that the story of the Queer Delegate Caucus has been being told ourselves on social media through a Facebook page as well as on Instagram at QDCUMC, and we have worked hard to be able to tell our own stories in our own ways over the past couple weeks. Thank you. Um, there's supposed to be two more uh, social principles issues coming up, the one incompatibility clause and the definition of marriage. Do you expect a full sweep um, or do you? Um, <laughs> uh -uh. 
don't be, don't be, don't, don't, um, don't. we're not, we're not, we're not superstitious in the Methodist tradition, but don't jinx us. <laughs> <laughs> the only we, thing you can ever count on happening at General Conference is the unexpected. So absolutely. Actually, and, and in Regardless fact. Regardless of whether that's changed, I guess, do you feel like victory is at hand for you that what you've come here to accomplish has been done already? Yeah, I'd like to point out and echo um, to what the, uh, the General Secretary said. Um, never underestimate the unexpected at, at General Conference. The discriminatory language came into effect into our Book of Discipline because of a mo an amendment from the floor. The initial phrasing that was put before the body of General Conference was just simply the affirmative part, that all people are of sacred worth. And somebody from the floor amended the incompatible with Christian teaching element, and it was voted on from there. We never know what's going to happen here. Yes, and um, I, but the signs point to more beautiful things to come. To add on to what Austin was saying, that amendment from the floor came in the waning minutes of the 1972 General Conference. Yes. So it was at the tail end, and so that... And just as a testament to you never know what's going to happen. And I believe it was also the third or fourth amendment to be proposed to the paragraph. So it was it was a long, convoluted Robert's Rules of Order yeah. <laughs> process. I, I, would, I would also like to add that we are about justice. And today we talk about the history of inclusion for LGBTQI plus peoples within the life of our church. But our work doesn't end with just queer identity. That is not all of what we are about. We're Absolutely. about the ending of colonialism, uh, income, in, 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 income differences, uh, poverty. We're, we're about ageism and sexism. We're about, uh, dare I say, racism. The church has so many problems that we need to be addressing today that this issue that, that, that has been made a wedge between us and society um, has hindered our ability to actually do the work of the church, which is to do the one commandment that Jesus told us to do. And, and that is to, to, to love one another. Jesus only gave us one commandment, and that was to love. And somehow, some way, we have failed in administering that commandment. But I pray to God that this day, and the days after and the years to come, we may live into the commandment that Christ has given us. Because Jesus also said, when we love one another, and when we love neighbor, and we love God, and we love ourselves, we, and we live into every other element of the law. It's all based around the concept of what it means to love one another. Not just the queer stuff, it's all of it. Yeah, the only thing we all have in common really is our queerness. And it just goes to show when we work in collaboration, we really see how our lives and the different aspects of our lives are the intersections of all the social justice issues. We get to learn from each other and learn ways that other, people's, other people struggle in different ways than we do. Um, and that only recommits re us to the broader picture of justice. Hi, I'm Laura, I'm with Vox Media. Um, I was wondering, so the votes have not been close. I know, I'm assuming we don't have a whole lot of data yet, but um, were you expecting that? And do you have any idea how to account for like what seems like a pretty dramatic change over the last, since 2019? Yeah. So I'll make a stab at that. Um, so were we expecting it? We knew we were prepared, I, I guess is, is the best way to say that. I mean, Effie's already talked about the work that was done beginning really at the closing bell of the 2019 General Conference. So there was, there was a, lot of, a long period of time for a lot of work to happen. Um, so we were prepared. Um, we organized and we settled on our priorities and we agreed with a broad coalition of United Methodists. Um, you might call it an intersectional coalition of United Methodists that we had three priorities that we came here to do and we were gonna do those three priorities. So I think that had an impact. Um, I, 
can only speak for myself in saying that when I saw the first votes coming in, that was the first moment that it dawned on me that we really might do this. Um, and that comes from the four previous general, or three previous general conferences I've been at where you see those votes come up and you think, it's close, it's close, it's close. No, it's not close enough. So um, I, I don't think that, that any of us came here convinced that we had everything in the bag. No, as much so. as we saw um, the votes even in committee last week coming in at wide margins, you, those of you who were here yesterday morning still saw how folks were holding their breaths in quite nervous anticipation. You can look at the facts on the ground, but past history has made us brace ourselves for, uh, for more hurt. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, it wasn't entirely a surprise, uh, but we weren't ready for it to go like this at all. <laughs> it's been a beautiful day. I, I've, I coined the term that I've been pessimistically optimistic. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm black in America. I don't know if y'all figured well. that out. <laughs> I'm a black woman in these United States of America who is queer. I live in the roundabout of intersectionality. I just do. It's a reality that I live and I face in the church that is predominantly white and predominantly male. Um, and so for me, what I expect out of the church is not much. <laughs> so I expect to be allowed to do my job and to, and to serve my people. And so we were hoping for 50% plus one where yeah. it was needed. We were hoping for 66% and where other places were needed. So to have the margins that we have were, was to show what a miraculous event this general conference is. Uh, we are we are we are experiencing um, a grace uh, unknown uh, and unseen in this United Methodist Church since 1972 at the Unifying Conference, when if we know our history, the conference worked to become a church that was significantly anti-racist. Mm -hmm. The role of the merging conference in 1972, the Unifying Conference, uh, was to make the church anti-racist. Dr. King had died in 68, Bobby Kennedy had died, and all these things had happened. And the unifying conference of 68 and, the, and then the, the general conference of 72 was to bring us to a new way of being people in these United States. And in 1972, the new boogeyman, instead of black people in the central mm -hmm. jurisdiction, the new boogeyman became gay people. And that, that was used to divide the church instead of blackness and whiteness. Now we are in a place now where we can look and see how are we going to be the church without the divisions that have held us back for so long. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about that history. And, and I'm so glad Archives and History is, is doing this thing today because I am a meth nerd. <laughs> and, and the idea that our church is striving to live into its purpose of making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world is a beautiful thing. So it, 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 it's, it's more than, than, than the gayness, even though it is fabulous. It is, also, <laughs> it is also about being the church for the people of God where they're at in order that they might see and know that they are valued and loved so very much. Peter Smith with the Associated Press. Um, for those of you who are clergy, um, since this is a history-themed conference, can you talk about what it was like to be clergy during the time when officially it was on the books that you shouldn't be? Um, it has taken great creativity and persistence. It's taken patience. Um, we survive and we keep moving forward and we find ways to serve we have done so in a variety of ways, in a variety of different contexts. The ways that we have moved forward as a denomination have been different in different geographic locations, and some of us have been able to serve more freely in certain parts of the, of the world and of the United States, and others have had to do so more privately. And so we hold together as a community. We love and support what we call our hidden faithful. And we celebrate those that can publicly and loudly proclaim on the front lines um, 
the love of God in the wholeness of ourselves. And so we have done so in many different ways and built community amongst ourselves throughout that process and supported one another. In 1970, in 1992, oh my goodness, <laughs> and, and that wasn't it either. In 1997, there we go, when I was ordained, um, Bishop Charlene Payne Kammerer, who is a retired bishop in the United Methodist Church, ordained me. Bishop Kammerer risked for me in my call. She risked her ministry. And there are bishops within the life of this church who ordained us at their risk. We couldn't talk about it and they couldn't talk about it, but we knew that they knew and they knew that we knew that they knew. And in turn, they gave us opportunities to serve. At the same time, when, uh, it was, when I was courting my wife and we were striving to figure out how we were going to live this life together, she was in New England and I was here in North Carolina. And she was willing to move to North Carolina. But I said, I can't ask you to come to a place where you can't be free. So I moved. I moved, I received an appointment. Bishop Kammerer made, wrote me a reference. And I moved to New England where I have served. And in the blessedness of serving in a place where you can be gladly and proudly out because New England said, oh, we're not doing this nonsense. We're going to let people be and we're going to look at gifts and call, which then in turn gave me the power to use that gift of being able to be out to affirm my siblings who cannot be out or could not be out. There are still places and spaces where people are not going to be able to come out. We understand that and we'll continue to serve them. But bishops and district superintendents and other folk risked in order that we might serve. Unless I take credit for my ministry alone, that is arrogant and false. I, I stand on the shoulders of the ancestors. Without the work of, of Jan in reconciling ministries, without the work of bishops like Charlene Payne Kammerer, without the work of, of bishops like uh, Bishop Oliveta, who risked so much, in, including her life, to serve. Without that, we wouldn't be here. So I'm honored that I was picked. I was selected by the Queer uh, Delegate Caucus to be the speaker today. And I'm honored that they she picked me. But there is more than just Effie doing this work. And when Effie dies, there'll be more people behind her continuing the work of justice. So I um, have the privilege of serving in a very safe conference. The Pacific Northwest Conference has long been ordaining out folks um, and only in recent years made that very explicit on the national stage, which helped set some of the, the tone for moving into where we are now. I want to, it, I really want to emphasize that it dramatically varies. I'm just touching you, I'm sorry, All right. I didn't ask. <laughs> you have consent. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but, it dramatically varies based on where you live and where, what the leadership in that conference, um, what they do. Um, so those of us who are often in the front, in front of the media or at the front of the rallies and the other things that have happened are usually there because we are the ones who are in the safer conferences, not by virtue of us being a better representative of the whole. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so Amen. we work uh, to make room for others. Mm -hmm. If I can, I named a couple names, and I want uh, historically, I named Ed Hansen, who is a pastor of Hollywood United Methodist Church, uh, the church that I'll be serving, um, and he, he was one of our hidden faithful. So he served and he was loved, um, but he was not able to do so publicly as I'm going to do now. And I named Beth Stroud, who was an amazing, uh, she is an amazing uh, uh, teacher. Um, and was ordained in my conference in Eastern Pennsylvania and was defrocked for being publicly um, uh, queer in the year that I started seminary. And so once again, I'm able to serve openly, honestly, because of the trauma that my conference experienced in her trial, that they were not willing to do that to me. And so I, I, am, I'm, I exist as the only queer delegate from the state of uh, not queer delegate, the only, let's be clear, 
the only member of the, uh, the Queer Delegate Caucus publicly from the state of Pennsylvania. Let's be accurate. Um, Brenda, the, may I? May I? May I ask my last question? Yes. Thank you. Cynthia Astle, United Methodist Insight. Given all the agony that you have described today, why did you stay in the United Methodist Church? And please make your answers brief. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an easy one for me, so I'll start. So I joined the United Methodist Church in my early 40s knowing full well what the discipline said. But I joined the United Methodist Church because of its mission in the world. And I also knew that I could advocate for change better from the inside than from the outside. Methodism is a way of life. It was never meant to be a denomination. It was meant to be a way that one lives. And I'm a United Methodist because they allow me to ask questions. Believe it or not, I come from traditions where yeah. asking questions were not allowed in church. And no church is perfect, and this one isn't. But we have work to make it a more inclusive and a more, a, what's the Methodism thing? We are being perfected yeah. in love. There Amen. it is. There you go. Yeah, uh, for me, it also is very much about uh, the work we can do on the global level, the things that we can do as a whole that one individual church can't possibly have the same level of impact. Take UMCOR, for example, and the disaster response that we were able to do. But for me, it most was the ability to ask questions and live faithfully. I grew up in Nashville uh, at the time of the Southern Baptist takeover. The conservative Christianity was in the air all around me. But my United Methodist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, grounded me in a faith that has changed my life. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 Hannah's got something. OK. <laughs> I stayed United Methodist because I am Wesleyan to my core, because this is my church, that this is my theology, mm -hmm. this is my home, and nobody's going to kick me out of it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Are we allowed to leave? <laughs> I got a vote. Yes. Oh, very well. oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.